these guys survived the David Kahn era of Timberwolves basketball and live to tell about it. It's flagrant. Hell. All right. Our guy Kyle and Jim Pete back tomorrow, it sounds like, on Flagrant House here. We got the sports dad Judd in on uh, this Timberwolves lifestyle podcast. I was in the building. You were in the building a couple nights ago for that Bulls yep. game. I was in the building last night. Nobody bugged Glenn Taylor again. No. You know, he just he He's came out there with his little the security and he yeah. you know, I ran into him in the back hallway. We did not speak. I, I don't think I he, hope you said hi. I don't think he knows who I am, but if he did, I think he would probably hate me because I've just been ripping him for like fifteen years. But he might no not booze. He, he might not care. Yeah, Strike he seems like he's just kind, of, just kind of kind of Teflon, you know. But there was like you said, there was at least one person that yelled, "Sell the team, Glenn!" I didn't even hear that. Two and yeah. a half hours, and that was before the game started, and it was just a lone voice. I I was like, this whole thing is, and and you know what? I will say this: good on the fans for appearing to just enjoy, as Mike Tice once said, this season. Yeah. Like, there's nothing you can do about it. Now, Now, does it cause some concerns? It absolutely does eventually, right? But when you're having this type of season and that building is electric right now, I'm almost glad that the fan base is like, okay, for now, screw this. This team's so much fun to watch. It does kind of feel that way, right? It kind of, I, was, I was talking to a few people there at Target Center. Just, you know, it's, it's the first time I've been in the building since the bombs dropped, the press release from Glenn Taylor and then the A-Rod and Laurie stuff and, and uh, yeah, I think the consensus is for now that both sides went public, both sides went nuclear, and there's even some buzz that maybe the league stepped in at some point this weekend behind the scenes and was like, you know, why don't you guys sense. shut the hell up for a minute? Yeah. Because A, you're the Timberwolves, and B, this is a lead into the playoffs and we don't need this being in the headlines every single day. So I, th I, th I think we're going to get kind of a calm period right. here. I think you're exactly right. I think you are right. And and I also think that it helps that it is the Wolves. Because, like, if this had been the Lakers or something, it would have been – it would have just taken off, right? Like a wildfire. I think the league – I think you're right. I think the league said, guys, look, you're not helping yourself on either side. So we'll sort this out. But, yeah, let this uh, play out. But you know what? Wolves fans deserve to have this enjoyment. They yeah. really do. Yeah, and the arena, once again, was just... One of the big differences, I feel like, let's, if, we're, if we're being self-reflective and honest here as Minnesota sports fans and media, there's a certain Minnesota sports fan anxiety that kicks in if your team starts to lose in a big game or, like, the adversity starts to mount. There's this, oh, here we go again feeling because we've been through so much the last 30 years or so. It feels like the opposite inside Target Center these days. Last night, again, they were down by like double digits in the first half. The Rockets are one of the hottest teams. They won 11 straight games before finally Dallas put an end to their multi-week winning streak. They're they're climbing up the standings, trying to get into the plan. And man, now they have a double-digit lead. They got these young players. They're finally figuring it out. And instead of the fans kind of sinking into their seats like, oh, man, that Bulls loss, and now here we go again. It's that feeling of dread. Fans started to try and will the team to yeah. jump back into the game. Chicago game, same way. Dude, yeah, like, the, like Bulls game, they're, same way. they're down by 10 or 12, and fans start getting on their feet and like, come come on, guys, yep. come on. We know we know it's in there. Yep, no, that's exactly how the, the Bulls game, in, in which they did come back, that's exactly how that game was. The other thing, too, though, that I think is at least – the recent vintage defeats for this team. I never watch them and think, well, that's some awful basketball. They've given up. Yeah. Like, you know, you fall down. I mean, for, first of all, in this league, if you're down by 10, it's not that much. But second of all, like that Bulls game, I don't know about you. I didn't think like that was some type of terrible performance where they didn't show up. They just got Agreed. beat. And they didn't play great, but I mean, it's an 82-game season. There's a difference between feeling like you're being ripped off if you paid for a ticket and your team competing and losing because you're going to lose games. Yeah, they showed up. Some of, sometimes and it's not like they played perfectly against the Bulls, and they certainly didn't play perfectly in the first half against the Rockets the first quarter. Um, but they but they show this level of fight. And actually, that brings me to my first observation. I've got some 
We did Judd's Wolves observations two days ago. We're going to do Phil's Wolves observations here. Observation number one, the Wolves have become so much better at handling adversity. Now, it could be micro adversity. You're down by 10 in the first quarter of this game against the Rockets. It could be macro adversity, which is the season is frustrating last year. And instead of us overcoming it, let's start punching each other and punching walls and early exit, right? Or in this case, wow, billionaires are slinging insults right. at each other all across the media, national media, local. How are we going to respond? I don't know. We'll read the headlines, shrug our shoulders, start watching film, and go beat the Nuggets and go beat the Rackets. Almost beat the Bulls. But whether it's overcoming double-digit deficits early in games, and Kyle Anderson said, and we'll get to him, by the way, the Kyle Anderson game last night, trademark that. Mm -hmm. um, he said last year, some of these games where we're down by like 10 or 12 points in the first half, it would have been over. It would have just been a 20 point loss or like we would have just gotten in our heads or started arguing with each other, their ability to adjust strategy on the fly. And I know, again, they lost the game against the Bulls, but Chris Finch even said, yeah, we actually just kind of had the wrong game plan in the first half. And we made an in-game adjustment here and there and voila, all of a sudden now we're back and we're fighting in this game. Yep. The other thing, I don't know what the exact percentage is today. The last time I looked at this, it was last week. The Wolves have the largest percentage of games of any team in the NBA in which they have won when trailing after three quarters. Now, they, they erased the lead, and they were leading going into the fourth quarter last night. But just like the ability to handle adverse moments, you're trailing in the first half, another team is punching you, your owners are fighting, whatever, whatever it is. Can you rise above it and still win a big game? And, man, it's the answer is yes, so much more this year than in 20 years of Timberwolves basketball. Don't you think that's also are in large part because there is a belief now? Like, like the Wolves, I think once you start to win games like that, and I mean, th this is a league of comebacks, but once you start to set the foundation of that you can win games like that, I think there's a a brashness it's not a cockiness because it's not like being cocky but there's a brashness of we've got this it's and a self-assuredness yeah yeah it, exactly and and i will say i think the absolute key and i i'm sure we'll talk about is shooting not being great of late i think the absolute key is you've such a glue guy in ant and ant is the guy there, there's two types of of uh of attempted alphas in my opinion in life there's the guy at work who, the who when you start your job, assures you he knows exactly what's up and that he's got this. But he really doesn't. And so it's like, if you're young, it's like, oh Hop my. on my back, everyone. Yeah. You know, no, no, I know what I'm doing. Bob, I'll the do coffee the coffee room's on fire right now. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> and, and you're like, you're an idiot. And you're dangerous because I believed you. But then there's a guy like Ant, who even if he's not playing well, has a... A, a cockiness and he really like things can be going sideways. The coffee room can be burning up, but he's got it still. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I haven't made a three pointer in a week, but I'm still going to throw down three exactly. monster dunks to and, ice the game in the fourth quarter and play lockdown defense. Yeah. And look at his box scores. He's still contributing the bulls game rebounds. He's still contributing yeah. like, but I mean, he has that, he has that self-assuredness that I think feeds a roster. Well, let's, that's a good segue into observation number two. And we will, by the way, give some love to a couple of bench players that deserve love. But my second observation is if Ant, in, if Ant isn't worried, I'm not really worried. So he li literally hasn't hit a three-pointer in a week. He's 0 for his last 20-something on three-point attempts. I like your theory. The more that I sort of watch, and I was I was running your theory by a couple other people too in Wolves Media Row, and I'm like, yeah, the Judd theory on his, it's not his shooting hand, which is why he can still go out there and play and get shots right. up, but right. his he literally dislocated a finger on that crazy dunk against Utah on his guide hand, and his shot just looks, a, it looks flat. It just yep. looks a little off. Yep. And after the game, he said, I know what the issue is. And by the time the playoffs come, this is a I'm getting it out of the way now. And I'm he didn't confirm your theory, by the way. Uh, but he said he knows what the problem is. I actually didn't. I didn't get long story short. I didn't go into the I was planning on going in the locker room, but I had the while. I had the okay, wrong kind of credential. And I it, it would have. OK. All right. I yeah, thought you might have said and and and. Phil Mackey, score north. No, I will. I, I plan on being in there for some okay. playoff games and stuff. Okay. I didn't get a chance to ask him that question face-to-face. -face, but 
Um, but he said by the time the playoffs get here, that three point shot's going to be butter. So don't worry about it. But to your point too, it's like okay, he's he's oh for his last week shooting threes. Well, he gets to the free throw line eleven times last night. Goes eleven for eleven from the free throw line. Yep. He starts going to the rim. He you know he throws down a couple huge dunks. He's picking pockets on defense. He still finds a way to make a positive impact on the box score and on the you know the result of the game. And after the Bulls loss, he tried to say that it's his legs are sort of shot, and I'm not buying that. Like, yeah. is, could he be tired? Sure. Do I think his legs are the reason why he he has not hit in the last three games? Just as a sample size, he's o for 19 on threes. That's why I think it's something different. Um, but but I also I'm with you. I believe that by the time the playoffs start, he'll be absolutely fine. Mm-hmm. So it's not like, a, oh my God, he's not he's not shooting well, and is this going to be a month long slump? I'm not buying that either. But the scary thing for the rest of the Western Conference is, let's go back to that Denver game for a second because I want to get I want to get it right. They blew the doors off the defending champions inside that building. Now, of course, Denver didn't have Jamal Murray, but the Wolves didn't have Cat. So okay, let's take each team's second best offensive player out. And, and now it should be even, plus the Nuggets are playing at home. Sure. And Anthony Edwards and Nas Reed went a combined 0 for 13 from three-point land. Nas Reed went 2 for 12. Anthony Edwards clearly not playing up to his full offensive potential. And they had a 23 or 25-point lead in the second half on the defending champions. That is really interesting that this team, and we've we've seen it a lot over the last couple months, where they're just not quite playing. When, when they play their top level of basketball, I think they're the best team in the Western Conference. We could debate about Boston on the Eastern side. But the scary thing is because you're not always going to play at your peak level. You're going to have a lot of nights where you're playing at like your 80th percentile or 75th percentile. Can you still win those games decisively? And the answer has been yes in a lot of these games against actual contenders in the West. So, um, okay, observation number three for you. I saw your little tweets, not yours, but you people in the audience, okay? Your comments on the Score North YouTube channel, Flagrant Howls episode. A lot of you folks wanted Kyle Anderson gone at the trade deadline. Oh, yeah. Get him out of here. He's a malcontent at the end of last year. He's, you know, he's he's gone from slow-mo to really slow-mo. Now he can't even get a three-point shot Royce off. Royce was mocking him. <laughs> yes. I, I think he called him Slow-mo, no. Get him, no, get I think he called ass. him no mo. No mo. <laughs> no mo. At one point, all you people were wrong, wrong about Kyle Anderson. So last night, I'm calling it the Kyle Anderson game. We should put it on some T-shirts. We should we should sell some uh, some merch. Thirteen points, nine assists, six rebounds, two steals, two blocks. Even knocked down a three pointer late in the game. The, he knocked down two three pointers. One it. was just after the buzzer rang. I, I love think, his in the first three. Half. I love his three. <laughs> Takes his a form, half hour to get it off. His form on the three is awesome. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> how it looks. And since the trade deadline, he has been a completely different. I mean, he's been much more like the player that we saw mm-hmm. last year, the Swiss Army knife that you can put in different positions on offense, defense. And Chris Finch, after the game, was asked about. I think it was Dane Moore that asked him. You know, hey. Kyle was kind of struggling at times early in the season. There were some rumblings at the trade deadline. You know, what what led to you maintaining confidence in Kyle Anderson? And Finch said, well, I try to have confidence in all my guys, right? But then he said, Kyle saved our season last year. He was in many ways our most important player on last year's team. He essentially said that team does not squeak into the playoffs without the 82 games, or I don't know if you, I can't remember how many games you play, but like the 82 game season of, of Kyle Anderson. And he is much closer to that player, if not even like equal to that player now compared to two or three months ago before the trade deadline. Mm-hmm. And last night was uh, was the coronation of 2024 Kyle Anderson. It was at one point he put like a fast break Euro step on a defender. The defender like <laughs> I like fell to his play. knees and Kyle gave like a Michael Jordan shrug as he <laughs> his <laughs> appealed facial to the crowd. Are great too. His facial expressions <laughs> are hilarious. Do you think this might sound cra- crazy, but do you think that there is a case to be made like internally he's the captain of that team in some ways? I think he's the, I think he's the the co-captain. I think the Timberwolves have it's been a while since Kyle and I have done the leadership power rankings. 
Oh, see, I didn't know you guys did that. Okay, yeah. We, we should. Oh, it's, like it. it's, 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 I think the last time we did leadership power rankings was like before the season. I'm going to give you impromptu leadership power okay. rankings right now. Because Ant often does refer to what Kyle told. I mean, Kyle sounds like he kicks Ant in the ass as much as Conley, if not more. Yeah, I, I still think, so I'm, uh, I should run this by Kyle and Jim Pete tomorrow too. So this is a good All exercise. Right. All right, let's go. I still think Mike Conley is number one in the leadership power Fair. rankings. He's not always as maybe boisterous right. or uh, verbose, but in terms of just like being a general on the floor, see you, how many times do you see him sitting right next to Ant on the bench during a timeout and he's got his hand on Ant's knee like telling him something, basketball parenting him, if you will. Pro's right? pro. Yep. So Mike Conley's number one. I think you're right. I think Kyle Anderson's number two. Okay. So we'll put slow-mo number two. Interesting. A guy that I don't know would have been in the top three a year ago or a year and a half ago. I think this team, now that D'Lo's been gone for a while, you, you, you get D'Lo out of here who was just kind of skeptical about Rudy Gobert and kind of clowned him to the media. And you bring in Mike Conley for validation, a better connection. I think Rudy Gobert has risen into this top three. He he is a he's a defensive head coach basically out there. He's like the defensive coordinator, and by the way, the best defensive player in the league. Yep. Teammates respect him. They're feeding him. You look at some of his recent offensive performances. Like his teammates are hunting for him, and the X's and O's. I mean, I lean on guys like Dane and uh, you know Jake Painting, Howls and Growls, who are much better with basketball X's and O's. But Chris Finch alluded to this too. The Rockets essentially started switching everything in that game. And some of the players in the locker room are like, what's the solution when when smaller lineups are just switching everything and it's harder for you guys to run pick and roll and things? And the answer a lot of times is feed Rudy. You know, if they're going to switch everything, oh, oh, there's a smaller guy on Rudy, like have him roll to the hoop, boom, all of a sudden he's catching the ball 10 feet from the hoop. Yep. So he's been a key part to breaking some of these smaller defenses too. So I'm going to go Rudy. Anthony Edwards is fourth. Hmm. Hmm. Who's fifth? Jordan McLaughlin has been a real nice, quiet addition here. Nas Reed, not again, not a vocal leader necessarily, but a great leader by example. Right. I don't know that, yeah, I'm not trying to dunk on Carl here, but I don't know that the team, even when he's healthy, I don't know that Carl cracks the top four in terms of a guy that's leading this collection, right? Hey, everyone rally around me for a second. I think no, he's he's a he's a really good sort of complimentary piece who happens to average role. 20 and 10. Yeah. He, he's best when he's worrying about what his role is, not not when he's trying to uh, yeah. galvanize the team. I've seen Monte Morris step up a little bit too in Las I, I would say it's it's a solid group of four here. And and I don't I don't know that we need to go any further on this exercise. Mike Conley, Kyle Anderson, Rudy Gobert, Anthony Edwards are your four main leaders of this thing. All right. It's a good list. It's a good list. I'm with you on Gobert. Gobert just seems, and it's not surprising, but my God, he seems so comfortable now. And like a year ago, everything felt clunky with him. Yeah. Like he felt, he li he literally felt like he had transferred high schools and he just wasn't D like Didn't know anyone sitting like at the Like the cool kids were like, no, table. man, you can't sit with us. No, go over. And he finally cracked it. <laughs> and now, and now, and look, I mean, against the Bulls, he he had a couple of really nice dunks and plays where he just goes crazy now. He starts pounding his chest and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, that's, guys feed off that. Dude, last night he had a reverse dunk at one point. He had, Anthony Edwards got pretty deep into the lane, saw that there was 19 defenders in his face. And so he just like kind of threw a blind lob up. He's like, I, I think Rudy's, Rudy is somewhere on the other side of these three defenders. He it's just like, like threw ball up. <laughs> And it wasn't the most accurate lob, but Rudy is a gigantic praying mantis. And so Rudy reaches back, grabs it with one arm, and just throws down yep. a one-arm alley-oop. Mm -hmm. So, by the way, there was um, the last few days in the Twin Cities, there's a French TV production crew that came to town. And they're working on two different things, I guess, that are going to air on, like, Paris TV stations and other French-speaking media outlets on Friday night. One is a Rudy Gobert profile. So they came in, they did, they they sat down with Rudy. But the other one is just talking to Timberwolves fans. There's a there's a huge interest in France with Rudy and now with the Timberwolves. 
And they even came into our studios at the, the Score North Studios, and they sat down and talked to the Flagrant House, to me and Ross, and took some stuff from Flagrant House. They were filming the arena last night when the Wolves were making the comeback. And, well, that's cool. Um, so, they're yeah, they're like documenting Rudy with the Timberwolves and the Timberwolves reaching this peak moment for the first time in 20 years. So, yeah, he's just um, – a year ago, everybody was unsure. Everybody. And, God, I was talking to somebody else last night, too, behind the scenes. Tim Connolly had to sit there for, like, 12 months. More than that, because the whole season, everyone's questioning. And then the, the second season doesn't start until, like, October. So, and, and he made the trade in July, right? So Tim Connolly sat there for 15 months listening to people on microphones, on keyboards, on prominent social media. Pe prominent people. Yes, Bill Simmons I mean, and Ryan Rosillo. Yeah, exactly. Basically say this is one of the worst trades in the history of the NBA, if not the history of the four major men's team sports. This is the Herschel Walker trade. Right. What was Tim Connolly thinking? Why would he come in here and make a trade like this? Is he Was he sent by the Nuggets to sabotage the Timberwolves? This is going to go down as an epic franchise folding trade, right? Like he had to sit in his office for 15 months and yep. listen to that. And I don't know. I, I wonder, I've never gotten a chance to ask him, like, did he ever waver? Was there ever a moment where even he was thinking, damn it. I, th I thought I, like, I thought I had a pretty good read on this roster building thing after 10 years with the nuggets, but now he's seeing it play out the way that he envisioned. I'm sure back in July of two well, summers ago. So I don't know, like, if, if you make that trade, I don't know that he would have necessarily wavered a ton, but you would be pissed off by a couple of things. One is Gobert showed up hurt or certainly fatigued for his first year here, which doesn't help things. Yeah. Which would have pissed me off. I mean, it pissed me off, and I'm Judd. I'm not Tim Conley. The yes. other thing the other thing is, you know, it's amazing now with with um with what they've done as far as making sure that Gobert had a role, his role, like a year ago, like to, to go back to the, the points, the, the advanced metrics that you brought up about combinations, you know, cat and Gobert, Nas and Gobert was awful. Um, and, and then the other, the other transitional factor that you can't doubt is, and perhaps Conley knew he was going to do this at some point was, Exchanging D'Lo for Con for for Mike Conley, yeah, and like, Nikhil Alexander Walker, like, yeah. But I mean, you've got, but I mean, you had D'Lo, you know, privately mocking the guy. Yep. Yeah, so toxic. It uh, it felt toxic. And it was toxic. It was good toxic. for like, D'Lo's playing largely some great basketball with the Lakers and great for him. But Conley and Nikhil. I'd take either one of those guys individually over D'Lo for this team in terms of fit. The fact that you get both of them in your rotation is completely ridiculous. Am I the only one that's slightly bugged, though, by one fact? That the fact that fans still, which th this is fine, they stand until the Wolves score their first basket is a D'Lo thing? I, I kind of hate that it's a D'Lo thing, but I love that we have some sort of fun I do like tradition it, now. But I hate it. Like, like he's the one, like this guy who didn't do Jack here is the one that called, you know, you dead-ass fans. Quiet-ass fans, yeah. Quiet-ass fans. He wasn't wrong. <laughs> no, he wasn't wrong, but I'm saying I, I just, I don't like, I wish it had come from somebody that was respected here. Yeah. You know, Maybe Mike we can Conley come up with that? something else. If Mike Conley had done that, it'd be like, yeah, this is awesome. I'm just saying D'Lo, of all people. Yeah, no, I get it. I, 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 that's his greatest gift, I think. His, it is. I, well, two great gifts, to give him credit, because he was instrumental in bringing the Wolves from like 20-some wins to 40 or whatever. And so you need certain players to do that. And he was instrumental in creating a new fun thing at Target Center. But he so. is also the guy who is directly, I, I mean, if there was one guy that can be identified as being directly responsible for, for Gobert transferring in from Bayside to here and being told you can't sit with us, it was him. Bayside, a little Saved by the Bell. Yep. I like it. Uh, I, have, I, I have another observation or two here in our final minutes, but just a quick shout out to our friends over at First Equity Mortgage. So if you're looking for a home or if you're looking to refinance, so for me, I had a great experience refinancing my home at the time, like seven years ago with David over at First Equity. 
And uh, David is a 20-year Wolves and Lynx season ticket holder. So they're, um, he's definitely one of us, so to speak, in terms of riding that roller coaster. Not only did I have a great experience with First Equity, but First Equity has handled home loans or refinances for 20 of my friends and or coworkers after doing a count. They work fast. They have a great reputation in the Twin Cities and in the industry. And they also offer programs for veterans and for new home buyers if you qualify. Go to femort.com. That's femort.com or scorenorth.com keyword David to find out more. Okay, another observation here. Jordan McLaughlin has become one of the most important bench players once again for the Timberwolves. He was very important for chunks in his career, especially the first half of last year. Then the calf injury, he just wasn't the same player after the calf injury. Most notably, teams leaving him wide open in the corner and just daring him to shoot threes, and he couldn't make one. He was a plus 17 in 18 minutes last night. And he's always been a great organizer, backup point guard, just a guy that gets you into the offense, gets you, gets the ball moving around. Like he understands how to stir the drink. But now he's shooting 51% from three point range on the season, three of four last night. And after the game, Chris Finch mentioned that he's actually one of the, so they track 50 50 ball stats. They, they've got some sort of, I don't know if it's like a manual tracking system or um, if it's analytically uh, produced, but. However the Wolves track it, he mentioned that Jordan McLaughlin is one of the best at corralling 50-50 balls. So like, oh, there's like a loose ball or whatever. Like he's great at corralling it and starting a fast break the other way or just restarting the offense if, you know, if it's a loose ball on offense. So Jordan McLaughlin, um, man, like 15 minutes off the bench here and there, 15, 20 minutes, a great organizer. So they essentially have three point guards now that they can lean on. Mike Conley, Monte Morris, and Jordan McLaughlin. All of them can knock down threes now if this is the trend now with Jordan McLaughlin. And you can put him out there with Anthony Edwards who can handle the ball. So they just, they're in a really good spot with guys who can handle the ball. Kyle Anderson can handle the ball as kind of a point forward too. So just giving some love too. This is a Jordan McLaughlin appreciation yeah. observation here. I was done with him last year too. Yeah, it, At it the end bad. of last year, I'm like, you can't keep him. Um, so like, like as far as the slow-mo hate goes, I wasn't as on board with that full disclosure with Jordan at the end of last season, I was a hundred percent done. So, yeah. Yeah. A lot. Of, I mean, I, man, I, I never, I never quite got on board with like the trade Kyle for sure movement. I really was skeptical about that, but yeah, I was, I was on board with, you can't have Jordan McLaughlin playing 15 minutes anymore if he can't knock down a three. But to his credit, he he is a different player so as a shooter. So his leg was gone. Hmm? Like, his his leg was, because of the calf, yeah, his I, leg was probably gone. And he wasn't, like, a great three-point shooter really at any point in his three years before this. So it's a, a bit of a small sample size, but the shot looks smooth. He's yeah. clearly been told and understands if you want to stay in the NBA, you got to knock down these corner threes. Uh, and then one final observation here, because we got to go record some write that down sessions. I love Chris Finch. So Chris, he, he's the most unfazed guy, the least phased guy, right? All this stuff is happening in the organization and he just shows up. He's like the sitcom dad of the NBA. You can hear like the laugh track in the background yeah, when he cracks his little one liners. Yeah. And uh, after the game, so he does his media session. And there's like a press conference room in the bowels of Target Center. But then there's like a, a media room where the writers kind of go across the hallway and they hack out their their stories, right? Sure. So he does his media session. And uh, there was some some pizza in the media room for the working media. And he just kind of wanders into the – I wasn't in there when this happened. But I guess he just kind of wandered into the media workroom and just ate a couple slices of pizza what? with the media. Pizza and beer? <laughs> I wonder if he got a beer. I don't know if he, if he cracked a beer or not. Uh, but yeah, he, uh, just hanging out, eating this couple slices of pizza as we wind down the regular season. Just, hey guys, how's, uh, how's your story coming along there? Huh? How Johnny K, how you guys doing over there? <laughs> how uncomfortable would, would Chris have been if he had coached pre pandemic and had to wear a suit? And tie right. Every game. Can you imagine like, him with like he, like Pat Riley slick back hair? <laughs> if you were to isolate on him and and show it to a basketball fan who didn't know who the coaches in this league were, I think nine out of the ten responses would be would be he's either a college coach or a high school coach. I could see college. Yeah, I could see college. But I, I mean, he always like, looks so put up on by the kids. 
to your point, like he's like, it's just, it's, it's a perfect look for a coach, but it does not look like an NBA coach, which is what I think is great about him. I could see him coaching, you know, like some Atlantic 10 school or something. I could like see him coaching St. Thomas. Oh, these kids are driving me nuts and I got to teach theology tomorrow. Yeah. So he'll get some love for coach of the year. I haven't seen the latest odds, but yeah, Finchie just unfazed, man. Unfazed through. Great. Through all this. So, all right, that's a wrap on this episode of Flagrant Howls. We'll talk to Jim Pete, we hope, tomorrow on the podcast. For Sports Dad, I'm Phil Mackey. This is a Timberwolves lifestyle podcast.